Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of opportunity. Fueled by immigration and innovation. With just a touch of authoritarian despotism. Here in these glorious United States, there exists a vast criminal underworld stretching from sea to shining sea. And if you look closely at our utopian American settlements, you may just find the stain of criminal activity in more places than you ever thought possible. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Geographies. Mafia rule, cartel rule, and death on an unprecedented scale. Tonight we examine a district of Liberty City with history and tragedy for days. A place that was once teeming with life, Italian stereotypes, and historical infrastructure, which was the site of the most brutal massacre in Liberty City history, brought on by its associations with organized crime. We will follow the tragic story of a neighborhood which once served as a cultural landmark to the city it was a part of, which fell victim to the worst elements of gang warfare amidst the chaotic mafia wars of the late 90s, and its later role in further violence which has characterized the area ever since, Fort Staunton. Describing Fort Staunton as a district, like with most things related to the area, must be done by discussing its two most prominent forms, those being before and after its near total destruction in 1998, which we will cover later tonight. Before the explosions, Fort Staunton was an arguably typical but foundational Italian-American neighborhood, characterized by many of the same hallmark businesses and building types seen in Liberty's other predominantly Italian district, Portland's St. Mark's. With narrow streets crisscrossing between the area's two larger avenues, and shops lining many of its streets, the old Fort Staunton was oftentimes claustrophobic, a fact that was not much helped by the constant presence of Italian wise guys who crowded or guarded many of the district's shops, which may or may not have been fronts for the Ferrelli crime family. On top of its many pizzerias and delis, old Fort Staunton also featured several iconic Liberty City buildings, with a rich history of their own, including Ristorante e Colai, the Fort Staunton Museum, and Fort Staunton Opera House, serving as landmarks and tourist attractions for the city. The district was also home to one of the many subway stations in Liberty City, allowing people from all across to easily visit its many eateries and theaters. However, ironically, this tether to the rest of the city would ultimately play a large role in the neighborhood's eventual tragedy. After the explosions, all of Fort Staunton's recognizable buildings were destroyed, including the Opera House and Museum, and the side streets adjoining its perimeter roads and avenues would all be demolished during the cleanup. The area would eventually be acquired by suspected front company for the Colombian cartel, the Panlantic Construction Corporation, and all of the land previously used for tenement buildings, shops, and landmarks would be rezoned for a commercial plaza, dominated by a single building which seemed to be aiming for the new tallest structure in Liberty City. Very little remained of even the old subway tunnels following the destruction, and despite the plans for redevelopment, the area never truly recovered. Both before and after the destruction, the district was characterized by two large avenues, one running north-south right through the center of Staunton Island, and another branching off of it to run northeast and southwest at an angle. Two smaller roads run parallel to the larger avenues to form a quadrilateral, which makes up the district's populated areas, while a larger avenue runs along its eastern edge and over a small body of water connected to the river, coming off of the inner city freeway. Before the bombing, several smaller side streets crossed in between the district's main quad, but upon rezoning, all the streets were demolished to make way for the future Staunton Plaza. The district borders Rockford to the north, Liberty Campus to the west, Newport and a small portion of Belleville Park to the south, and the river to the east. As we've alluded to already, the history of Fort Staunton is grim and plagued with violence, even more so than most districts of Liberty City. For years, the area was relatively peaceful under the control of the Ferrelli crime family, but by the late 1990s, war between the Ferrellis and their St. Mark's-based rivals, the Leone and Sindaco families, brought blood and bullets to the quiet Italian streets for the first time in presumably decades. In 1998, when elements of the Sicilian mob under Massimo Torini orchestrated violence between the three Liberty City families, Fort Staunton would serve as one of the primary battlegrounds, at first between the Ferrellis and Sindacos, but later the Ferrellis and the Leones. Don Salvatore Leone would himself become caught in the middle of a battle between the Ferrelli and Sindaco soldiers while spying on them, and call upon Tony Cipriani to help fight their way out of the area to live another day. Cipriani would bring further bloodshed and destruction to the area both intentionally and unintentionally. 
First, when he burned down a building containing voting machines and killed numerous Ferrelli soldiers, while attempting to secure victory for the Leone-backed candidate Donald Love in the mayoral election of that year. And again when attending an opera with Toshiko Kassan of the Yakuza in order to gain her favor and humiliate her husband Kazuki, which is attacked by Ferrelli soldiers resulting in a shootout and hasty escape by Tony and Toshiko. And finally, at the height of the Mafia Wars, Fort Staunton, as the home of the Ferrelli crime family, was targeted by the Leones in the most devastating act of terrorism the city has ever seen. With help from bomb expert and Leone associate 8-Ball, Tony Cipriani would use an incompleted section of the city's subway line under the district to plant explosives at strategic locations all along the tunnels. Though largely unknown by the public until now, the initial plans to target Fort Staunton stemmed not from the Leones themselves, but from one of their allied politicians who had failed to secure the mayor's office in his recent election, Donald Love. When Love is bankrupted by the election loss, he concocts an elaborate, complicated scheme to facilitate regrowing his enormous fortune by securing construction contracts with the Colombian cartel front, the Panlantic Construction Company. With one single act, thousands of people in the district would lose their lives nearly instantaneously, with many hundreds more in the coming days and weeks turning up amongst the missing. Though it would win them the war, had the Leones been exposed prior to their downfall for their role in destroying Fort Staunton, it's possible the entire city would have turned against them for good. But as things stand, the destruction would instead be blamed on a rumored munitions storage in the area, controlled by the Ferrellis, which while a plausible excuse was either a complete failure on the part of the investigation committee, or a deliberate obfuscation ordered by Don Salvatore, who now owned Mayor Miles O'Donovan. Following the bombings, military personnel would patrol the district as investigations into the causes took place, which may have continued as late as 2000, during which time, oddly enough, the Portland-based triad seemed to hold some limited influence over the neighborhood for whatever reasons. By 2001, the district would finally begin to see the fruits of Donald Love's scheming when plans for Staunton Plaza were finally underway. The new massive skyscraper would be nearly halfway completed by the time the district once again gained infamy for its continued association with violent crime and the criminals who commit it. Being tied directly to the interests of the Colombian cartel and being an asset of Donald Love, it would become the site of a meeting point between former lovers turned bitter enemies, Claude and Catalina, and later, following Catalina's escape, serve as a staging point for Yakuza leader Asuka Kassen, when Claude's attempts to find and kill Catalina spark a gang war between her organization and the cartel. Prior to 1998, Fort Staunton was home to many shops, restaurants, and important landmarks, some of which include Ba, Ballot Paper Factory, Bobella, Botilia, Clomnapras, Market at Delhi, Fort Staunton Museum, Fort Staunton Opera House, Hotel Forte, Liquor Charlie's Bar and Grill, Page 3 Bookstore, Ristorante E. Coli, Signora Grande, and the Staunton Cafe. Following the destruction of the district in 1998, the only notable shops or places of interest were Capitali, Pizza, Steps Clothing Company, One Hour Photo, Metropolitan Catering, Market in Delhi, albeit in a different location, and the Staunton Plaza construction site. Okay guys, time to quickly jump out of character and take a look at the real-world inspiration for the Fort Staunton district, prior to its destruction at the hands of Tony Cipriani. Most evidently, and thanks once again to the wonderful GTA Wiki, Old Fort Staunton was based off of the Old Little Italy of Italian Harlem, and a little bit less so, the modern Little Italy of Manhattan. This can be seen pretty obviously when taking a look at the district's building design pre-destruction, with buildings like the Fort Staunton Opera House possibly being based on the Harlem Opera House, which started showing movies in the 1930s. Fort Staunton's narrow streets are also very reminiscent of the cozier parts of modern Little Italy, with many shops, often of Italian origin, along its smaller side streets, and residential apartments above them, much like the similarly inspired St. Mark's District, which we examined in Episode 2. Given the relative simplicity of the district's design based on the Renderware engine, which was, at the time of Liberty City Stories, already badly showing its age, it's hard to give any more direct comparisons of specific buildings, but the inspiration here is again, like St. Mark's, worn right on its sleeve. And thus ends our first foray onto Staunton Island. Next week we will be heading to Newport for a look at Staunton Island's own Yakuza, and their legacy of death and violence. If for some reason you're not already aware, be sure to check out my main series, Grand Theft Auto Biographies, every Monday at 3pm Eastern, and stay tuned for new episodes of GTA Geographies every Friday at 9am Eastern. 
If you find yourself enjoying this content, why not leave a like, comment, and while you're at it, subscribe to see new episodes as soon as they release. If you want to go the extra mile, consider supporting me on Patreon to help keep my channel independent and get some goodies in the process. I'll see you next time. I'm your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching.